Hi, I'm James Green, and your host for another episode of Your Catholic Faith Today. We've been reading Sister Lucia, Apostle of Mary's Immaculate Heart, where we left off with Jacinta and Francisco, having just left their friend Lucy to join Our Lady in Heaven. Before we get back to the story, though, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now back to the story. Lucia finally, the Lucia leaves Fatima. Being around much death and suffering takes a toll, and Lucia's health began to fail. She became pale and listless. Some were concerned enough to ask Maria Rosa to let Lucia live with them for brief periods in the hope that a change of scenery would revive her. Maria Rosa consented. When away from home like this, Lucia wrote, I did not always meet with the esteem and affection. While there were some who admired me and considered me a saint, there were always others who heaped, upon, heaped abuse upon me and called me a hypocrite, a visionary, and a sorceress. This was the good Lord's way of throwing salt into the water to prevent it from going bad. Thanks to this divine providence, I went through the fire without being burned or without becoming acquainted with a little, little worm of vanity which has the habit of gnawing its way into everything. On such occasions, I used to think to myself, they are all mistaken. I'm not a saint, as some say, and I'm not a liar either, as others say. Only God knows what I am. For all the losses she had suffered, Lucia remained unusually well-balanced for a 13-year-old. There was not a trace of vanity or self-pity in her. This was well, for national and international politics were being brought to bear on Fatima and, inevitably, upon Lucia herself. Diplomatic relations between the Portuguese Republic and the Vatican were finally restored in 1918. The following year, Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict XV urged Portuguese Catholics to submit themselves to the Masonic government. This goodwill gesture fell upon ears of stone as the Republic continued persecuting the Church and attacking Fat <clears throat> the Fatima apparitions. The Patriarch of Lisbon, Cardinal Mendes Belo, joined in by threatening to excommunicate any priest who spoke in favor of Fatima. The Cardinal may have been exercising the prudence customary of the Church with new apparitions, or perhaps he was trying to maintain a working relationship with the Republic. In either case, one can appreciate the courage it took for priests like Father Cruz and Canon Formaggio to befriend Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. The Diocese of Liria, which included Fatima, was also restored and in 1920 obtained a bishop, Dom José Alves Carrera de Silva, whose Celtic face bellied his Portuguese heritage. A frequent pilgrim to Lourdes, his excellently had suffered as a priest under the Republic. Taken from his rectory and imprisoned, he was forced to stand in icy water day and night, which left him able to walk only with difficulty. Small wonder he had a particular devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows. Bishop de Silva's first order of business was figuring out what to do about Fatima. He arranged an interview with Lucia and Maria Rosa on June 13th, the Feast of St. Anthony. He asked Lucia if she would, uh, would like to go to school. She said yes. He said the school was run by the Sisters of St. Dorothy in Porto. Lucia nodded in agreement. Maria Rosa nodded empathetically. Fatima still perplexed her, and the continual stream of visitors and the exalted deference they gave Lucia drove her past distraction. Perhaps it would be best for all if Lucia left home. His Excellency told Lucia she would have to leave in four days. She agreed. He told her she could not tell anyone where she was going. This meant Lucia could not say goodbye to T. Marto and Olympia or Maria Carrera. 
but Lucia agreed not to, not to tell anyone. Then he told her she must not tell anyone at the school who she was. Lucia agreed. The final stipulation was that Lucia not mention the Fatima apparitions to anyone. She agreed. In the short time left to her, Lucia said goodbye to places and things, not people. The night before she was to leave Fatima, forever for all she knew, she went to all the familiar places so dear to us. She met herself and her two cousins, who would ever be in her thoughts. My heart was torn with loneliness and longing, for I was sure I would never set foot again on the Cabezo, the Rock, the Linos, or in the parish church where our dear Lord had begun his work of mercy, and the cemetery where rested the mortal remains of my beloved father and of Francisco, whom I could still never forget. I said goodbye to our well, already illumined by the pale rays of the moon, and to the old threshing floor where I had so often spent long hours contemplating the beauty of the starlit heavens and the wonders of sunrise and sunset which so enraptured me. I loved to watch the rays of the sun reflected in the dewdrops so that the mountains seemed covered with pearls in the morning sunshine. And in the evening, after a snowfall, to see the snowflakes sparkling on the pine trees was like a foretaste of the beauties of paradise. Without saying farewell to anyone, I left the next day at two o'clock in the morning, accompanied by my mother and a poor laborer called Manuel Correa, who was going to Luaria. I called with my secret I carried my secret with me in Violet. We went by the way of Covadiera so that I could bid it my last farewell. There, for the last time, I prayed my rosary. As long as this place was still in sight, I kept turning around to say a last goodbye. Out of prudence and humility, Lucia omitted a meeting she had at the Cova on the evening of June 16th, a short distance from where Lucia prayed. The beautiful lady stood where the first steps of the basilica would one day be. The two beheld each other for a time in silence. Perhaps Lucia was once more stunned to silence by the lady's beauty, or perhaps words were not necessary here at this blessed place where heaven met earth and handed to a rough peasant girl the will of God and the secrets of heaven. <clears throat> Wordlessly, they parted. The lady probably left first, for how could Lucia leave her? What was the significance of this silent encounter? Only heaven and perhaps Lucia knew with certainty. Perhaps the lady willed to provide Lucia some companionship, to give her someone to say goodbye to, or simply to abide her, to abide with her in her in her loneliness. Lucia may have thought she would never return to Fatima, but she surely knew that the lady would return to her. First Saturday's Request, December 10th, 1925. Lucia left Fatima with my poor heart plunged in an ocean of loneliness and filled with memories that I could never forget. Her new life started well with a morning mass at the Dorothean Chapel. Afterwards, Lucia was taken to the Mother Superior, who was less than impressed. What a strange creature from the hills, she said under her breath to the chaplain. She reviewed Bishop De Silva's instructions with her new pupil. Then the Mother Superior changed Lucia's name to Maria das Oro Dores, Maria of Sorrows. Although the name had a certain aptness to it, the main reason for the change was so that the Mother Superior could tell visitors, no, we have no one named Lucia here. Lucia spent the next four years studying, praying, and blending into the woodwork. Cheerful and agreeable, she obeyed every instruction instantly and efficiently. Fatima was not mentioned once. It was as if it had never happened. Of her years at the Villa boarding school, Lucia would say simply, I lived exactly as one of the others. Except that she read the life of St. Therese and discovered a longing for the Carmelite way of life. Mother Pete Superior said she was not strong enough for the austerities required of Carmelites and told her to find another order. In short order, Lucia picked the Dorothean order. But Mother Magalis, the new superior, told Lucia she was too young to join a religious order. She was 17. Lucia did not mention the matter again. <clears throat> a 
A year later, Mother Superior asked Lucia, Maria das Torres, have you abandoned all thought of entering religion? Never, Mother. Not for one moment have I forgotten. Except, except what, my child? That I was told to wait and have waited. This example of humility and strict obedience is accentuated by the fact that Lucia still longed to be a Carmelite a vocation she would eventually realize after years of offering as a sacrifice to heaven, her longing for what turned out to be her true vocation. Her humility shone through in her gratitude to be a Dorothean sister, which she expressed in a letter to Canon Formaggio. I hope to enter the Institute of St. Dorothy in Spain at the end of October or early November. Because I am so unworthy of such a great grace, I ask your reverence to do me one more act of charity, to thank Jesus for me, and ask of him that I do the divine will in all things. May your reverence please excuse this humble sinner who will never forget you before Jesus in the most holy sacrament and Mary most holy. Since Portuguese orders were forbidden by law from receiving candidates to the religious life, Lucia traveled just across the northern border of Portugal to Tui and from there to Pontevedra, where she began her novitiate. <clears throat> because of her evident virtues, she was allowed to skip the preliminary step of being an aspirant and was directly admitted as a postulant, a very rare privilege which Lucia had prayed for in the summer of 1925. One Thursday evening, Lucia returned to her cell after supper. Here is her account of what happened there, narrated in the third person. On December 10, 1925, the Most Holy Virgin appeared to her, and by her side, elevated on a luminous cloud, was the child Jesus. The Most Holy Virgin rested her hand on her shoulder, and as she did so, she showed her a heart encircled by thorns, which she was holding in her other hand. At the same time, the child said, Have compassion on the heart of your Most Holy Mother, covered with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Then the Most Holy Virgin said, Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You at least try to console me and announce in my name that I promise to assist at the moment of death with all graces necessary for salvation, all those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, shall confess receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary, with the intention of making reparation to me. This episode was the fulfillment of the Blessed Virgin's words to Lucia at the COVID era on July 13, 1917. I shall come to ask for the Communion of Reparation on the first Saturdays. Almost as striking is the Blessed Virgin touching Lucia on the shoulder, as a friend. Perhaps this singular grace so confounded Lucia's humility that she narrated the episode in the third person to hide her role in the apparition as much as possible. The Blessed Virgin did more than ask for repertory communion and devotions on five first Saturdays. She promised heaven to those who practiced this devotion sincerely and with a spirit of reparation. Those who wonder whether it is Mary's place to promise eternal salvation to anyone Forget one of her illustrious titles, Mediatrix of All Graces. Lucia informed her mother superior and her confessor about this apparition immediately. The confessor told Lucia there was already a first Saturday devotion, which was true. Her subsequent confessor at Tui, Father Jose Bernardo Gonzalez, wrote Lucia asking her to explain the reason for first five Saturdays of devotion. After completing a holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament one Thursday evening, Lucia wrote him back. I spoke to our Lord about this question, f about questions four and five. I suddenly felt myself more intimately possessed by the divine presence and, if I am not mistaken, this is what was revealed to me. <clears throat> My daughter, the reason is simple. There are five types of offenses and blasphemies committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. One. Blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception. 2. Blasphemies against her perpetual virginity. 3. Blasphemies against her divine maternity. 
in refusing at the same time to recognize her as the mother of men. 4. The blasphemies of those who publicly seek to sow in the hearts of children indifference or scorn, or even hatred, of this Immaculate Mother. 5. The offenses of those who outrage her directly in her holy images. See, my daughter, the motive for which the Immaculate Heart of Mary inspired me to ask for this little reparation, and in consideration of it, to move my mercy to pardon souls who have had the misfortune of offending her. As for you, always seek by your prayers and sacrifices to move my mercy to pity for these poor souls. In a few years, Bishop De Silva himself began promoting the repertory devotion of five First Saturdays. As the devotion began to be practiced, Lucia wrote Father Aparicio, Your reverence cannot imagine how great is my joy in thinking of the consolation which the holy hearts of Jesus and Mary will receive through this lovable devotion and the great number of souls who will be saved through this lovable devotion. I say, who will be saved, because not long ago, our good Lord, in His infinite mercy, asked me to seek to make reparation through my prayers and sacrifices, and preferably to perform reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and implore pardon and mercy in favor of souls who blaspheme against her, because the divine mercy does not pardon these souls without reparation. Eight years had passed since the apparitions of Fatima. Some have questioned the length of time between Fatima and the apparition at Pontevedra, and in doing so cast doubt on the relation between the apparitions. If one takes the Blessed Virgin at her word, however, there is no discrepancy. At Fatima she said she would come again to ask for the communion of reparation, and at Pontevedra she, she did just that. True doubt would have been cast on the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin hadn't come again. The Great Tui Apparition, 1929. On July 16, 1926, Lucia left Pontevedra to enter the novitiate of the Dorothean Sisters at Tui, a Spanish town just across Portugal's northwestern border. She received her habit on October 2, 1926, and pronounced her first vows the next day. Maria Rosa attended and afterwards gave Lucia a gift. A, a hive of bees, a simple, homemade contraption fashioned of cork that would supply the community with honey. Maria Rosa must have been popular on the train ride to Tui. For Lucia, life continued as it had since she left Fatima. She did not speak of the apparitions, and no one spoke to her about them. She quietly excelled in matters of obedience, humility, and charity. She had fun planning Christmas festivals, planning plays and designing scenes always among the most spontaneous of impromptu singers, witty, often comic, and forever herself. One day, Lucia and another sister crossed the International Bridge to Portugal to do some shopping in Valencia for their order. They were stopped in the street by questioners. You are Doroth Dorotheans, aren't you? Have you come from Tui? Yes, madame, Lucy replied. We are going there ourselves, one woman said. We want to see Lucia, the seer of Fatima. Really, said Lucia. She is there, isn't she? No, madame, Lucy replied. She is in Portugal. The questioners were disappointed, but persevering. If she were in Tui, sister, would we not be able to see her? Certainly, madame, Lucy answered. And how would we go about it? Well, just by looking at her, madame, as you are looking at me said Sister Lucia, blending honesty, prudence, and humility perfectly. A final anecdote from Father de Marchi concerns Lucia's superior, who would test her obedience occasionally by assigning her an onerous jobs. One such assignment involved Lucia emptying a cesspool. Lucia went to work without a murmur and returned later covered with filth and reeking of it, a combination that sent the mother superior reeling. Lucia stood there, her eyes glowing and her face enraptured. The mother superior blurted out, What has happened to you, child? With humility and contained joy, Lucia quietly answered, Our Lady has just appeared to me. Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucia at least one other time while she was at Tui. It happened in 1929, on the anniversary of the June 13th apparition at the Cova. The account of the apparition at Tui 
was transcribed by Lucia's spiritual director, Father Jose Bernardo Gonsalves, from Lucia's notes. Reverend Father Gonsalves sometimes came to our chapel to hear confessions. I went to confession to him, and, as I felt at ease with him, I continued to do so for three years that he remained here as assistant to the Father Provincial. It was at this time that Our Lady informed me that the moment had come in which she wished to, to make known to the Holy Church her desire for the consecration of Russia and her promise to convert it. The communication was as follows. I had sought and obtained permission for my superiors and confessor to make a holy hour from 11 o'clock until midnight, every Thursday to Friday night. Being alone one night, I knelt near the altar rails in the middle of the chapel and, prostrate, I prayed the prayers of the angel. Feeling tired, I then stood up and continued to say the prayers with my arms in the form of a cross. The only light was that of the sanctuary lamp. Suddenly, the whole chapel was illumined by a supernatural light, and above the altar appeared a cross of light reaching to the ceiling. On a brighter light on the upper part of the cross, could be seen the face of a man and his body as far as the waist. Upon his bre breast was a dove of light. Nailed to the cross was the body of another man. A little below the waist, I could see a chalice and a large host suspended in the air, onto which drops of blood were falling from the face of Jesus crucified and from the wound in his side. These drops ran down onto the host and dropped into the chalice. Beneath the right arm of the crosses was Our Lady, and her hand was her immaculate heart. It was Our Lady of Fatima, with the immaculate heart in her left hand, without sword or roses, but with a crown of thorns and flames. Under the left arm of the cross, large letters, as if of crystal clear water which ran down upon the altar, formed these words, Grace and Mercy. I understood that it was the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity which was shown to me, and I received lights about this mystery, which I am not permitted to reveal. Our Lady then said to me, The moment has come in which God asks of the Holy Father to make, and to order that in union with Him, at the same time, all the bishops of the world make the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to convert it because of this day of prayer and of worldwide reparation. I gave an account of this to the confessor, who was then the Reverend Father Jose Bernardo Gonzalez, a Jesuit. His reverence asked me to write it down, which I did, giving the paper to his reverence on June 13, 1930. Ave Maria. In his subsequent letter to, the, to Father Gonzalez, Lucia interpreted the vision at Tui to include the first Saturday repertory devotion. If I am not mistaken, our good Lord promises that the persecution in Russia will end, if the Holy Father will make himself will himself make a solemn public act of reparation and consecration of Russia to the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary. His Holiness must also order all the bishops of the Catholic world to do so, and promise that if this persecution ends, he will approve and recommend the practice of the already mentioned repertory devotion. During her revelation of the Fatima secret at the COVID era on July 13, 1917, the Blessed Virgin had told Lucia, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. It is evident from Our Lady's own words at Fatima that her subsequent, subsequent visits to Lucy at Pontevedra and Tui, far from bringing a new or different message of Fatima, are the indispensable fulfillment of Our Lady's revelation at the Covadiera. One can only marvel at these glimpses of the interior life of Sister Lucia and hope that the writings that were seized from her cell upon her death will one day be published to the world in all their integrity. For not only has she been visited by the heaven, she has also been taken up to heaven. 
the third heaven St. Paul was permitted to visit. Sister Lucia's words are virtually identical to St. Paul's. I understood that it was the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity <clears throat> which was shown to me, and I received lights about this mystery which I am not permitted to reveal. How formidable her virtues must have been to withstand such a revelation and to continue her life in all humility and sincerity. Letters and Memoirs, 1930 to 1942. The following spring, May 1930, Lucia wrote written responses to a brief interrogation concerning the apparitions at Pontevedra and Tui. The interrogator was Father Gonzalez, her spiritual advisor. He forwarded Lucia's response to Bishop de Silva and found a way to get the substance of Lucia's answers to His Holiness, Pope Pius XI. It was hoped the Holy Father would respond to the Blessed Virgin's request for repertory devotions and the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart. None was forthcoming. A year passed. Sister Lucia took ill and was sent to recuperate at Rianajo, a small coastal town near Pontevedra. There she received a communication from heaven, which she wrote to Bishop Silva about. And so, Sister Lucy has left her family and friends in Fatima to join the Dorothean sisters in Tui, Spain. As we have come to expect from Lucy, she has proven her devotion to our Lord and Our Lady and has committed her life to their service. While it is not everyone's path to leave the world behind and join a monastery or a convent, we can definitely show our devotion by taking the time to say the rosary and offering up sacrifices every day. That's all the time we have today, though. I want to thank you again for joining me on Your Catholic Faith Today. I'm your host, James Green. God bless. I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, who is already deeply offended. 